Maine. Thursday keynote address. Hi, I am Dr. Mudge from The Loft up in Boston. We uh, like to refer to it as the Hacker Think Tank. Give me one moment here. I was expecting to be wireless and neato, and of course, they're replacing it back to cable. Okay, technical difficulties. Hmm. So, um, keynotes. Jeff had asked me to do a keynote, and I said, well, that's, that's kind of interesting because you really can't go tremendously technically in detail for a keynote. It's got to be this nice, fluffy, warm, fuzzy, uh, um, fooferific type show that makes everybody happy and uh, is really deplete of any useful information. So I said, cool, I'm, I'm, I'm there, and we'll do it. The title of it uh, ended up being, and I, I've already, already been chastised by this, if anybody takes the title seriously, um, you know, have a beer, relax. It's, it's close your mind, you can find all you need with your eyes. Uh, I have to have interesting, annoying titles. For instance, for those who saw me at Sands realized that the uh, title of the talk was a springtime existential romp with Robespierre and friends. Um, for those who don't understand the French history, look it up, it's kind of enjoyable. Um, so, I said, okay, Jeff, what we're going to do is uh, we'll kind of try and walk through, point out the problems, because there's tons of problems, and everybody sees the problems, and everybody comes to these, and they nod their head vehemently and say, oh, yeah, look at all those problems, and they go back to work and ignore it. Uh, so, hopefully, we'll be able to give people a few ideas of some solutions, and then look at it from, you know, how do the technical people really play into this, and why is there the disconnect when the technical people talk to the middle management or the upper management, if they're even allowed to, uh, and then the middle management, why the disconnect there, or why we even need them, uh, and then the upper management, and maybe what they can do to help uh, actually do some sort of top-down dissemination to make the world work a little bit better. Uh, I, I have to say that coming from the loft and coming ex extremely from a technical side of things and being thrust in the position of now uh, being the, you know, in, in lack of a better terms, the, the CEO of the loft uh, and having to deal with managing a bunch of hackers, uh, which is much like herding cats, and then also seeing <laughs> the the people at uh, upper levels of uh, vice presidents and CEOs of larger organizations, and then, of course, going and talking to a bunch of senators, which uh, actually happened again after the, the Senate hearings. I'm, I'm consistently impressed by the level of knowledge and the understanding and, and just the, the brightness of some of these senior executives. And if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense because they have to kind of know what they're doing in order to get up there. The problem is as soon as they get up there, for instance, almost all the, at least the Democratic senators are all Rhodes Scholars. And you can sit down and you can have a great conversation over dinner with them and they're really, really bright people. The problem is they're so buffered from the world, they have no clue what's going on. You know, so hopefully we're going to try and fix some of that. So why don't we hit the first slide and get into this and set the little timer. I talked for five minutes there. Okay. Okay. Lack of security expertise in the market. Um, I mean, you you have to be here, so you have to be wondering. You know, why are you here? If it's just to hear that the world is all messed up and that we're all going to hell in a handbasket and that everybody owns all of the systems out there and nothing is uh, protectable and there is no such thing as absolute security, um, well, that's all true. Um, but we're going to try and look at some of the problems inside these corporations and then hopefully give some new ways of looking at it towards, towards the back. So, um, and I know some people already approached me because they're flipping through the slides and looking at the end of the very beginning. Um, I, I have also done technical talks uh, to get people like that with problems and left intentionally bad slides in there. So maybe I did that again. 
Uh, generic corporations. When I mean generic corporations, I mean large IBM, uh, GTE, slash AT&T. I mean really big scale organizations. You're talking 40,000 systems and up minimum. Normally you're talking 200,000 to 500,000 systems. And anytime you go to these organizations, you are going to get this little ratio of a few, excuse me, really bright people uh, and a whole bunch of really average people. And that's just the way the world is. Uh, the problem is a lot of times you can't find the really bright people in there, especially when it comes to security. So why, why is there this lack of security expertise? Well, um, any large organization can't have security as their overriding um, goal or directive. If it's just security, they aren't a generic, extremely large corporation. Uh, we'll talk about the government agencies and stuff about uh, a little later. Uh, Ford Motor Company cannot have security as their overriding, you know, this is what we do, we sell, we make security. No, they sell and they make cars. Uh, now, they have to have a component, and thanks to Ralph Nader, uh, for Secure, and that's, you know, that's what the loft is, where the Ralph Nader Consumer Reports meets, uh, you know, who knows, <laughs> Stephen King. <laughs> um, uh, they have to have a component of security, but they can't stop the production line when they think that, oh, well, if somebody pushes this wrong button, or if somebody drives at an, at an unsafe speed and smashes the car, there's a chance that they will die. Um, they don't have the internal expertise to quantify or qualify security professionals, and this is really interesting. And this, this to me, uh, a lot of these will go across the, the next two slides for generic corporations, developers, ISPs, uh, government agencies. If you don't have the expertise in-house, you have no clue what you're being presented. I mean, I've seen people, I was, I was consulting at a large organization, and they said, hey, Mudge, would you, uh, you know, this, this, we're trying to interview a head security guy. Would you come over here and uh, interview him? You know, he seems to know the lingo, but, you know, we have no way of understanding, you know, whether this guy is full of shit or not. And I said, okay, sure. And I walked over, and the guy proceeded to tell me how he wrote loft crack. <laughs> you know, so that's nice. You know, hire him. I mean, loft crack's a pretty cool tool. <laughs> but, um... <laughs> And, and there's a lot of that out there because there is no policing, there is no, you can't go in an organization and say, yeah, I've got all the hot shot security engineers here. They know everybody in the community. They know the good guys. You know, unless you're son, you can't sit there and call on Casper Dick. And even if you are son, you probably don't even know you have Casper Dick. And that's a real shame. But, um, so... Yes, there is an extreme lack of understanding. And the, the security vendors, which they have their own slide in here also, do the exact same thing because they come in and they're like, you know, hey, we've got the greatest thing since sliced bread. This is the security. It will secure your environment. And the large organizations say, okay, you know, what, what can they do? Are they going to sit there and say, did you do the, the crypto right? Do you have race conditions? What do you do for random number generators? How is it built? What was the implementation? Des looks great. Des is nice. Des is secure crypto. Okay, you know, deep, uh, deep thought or whatever withstanding and some other stuff. Uh, triple Des, Blowfish, you name it, you know, idea. It's the implementations that are going to bite you, and none of these guys have the expertise to do the reverse engineering in-house and give themselves good assurance that what they're getting really isn't a bunch of snake oil. So, oh, then there's the, uh, then there's the big notion of plausible deniability through buck passing, and this goes across all the different corporations also. If a vendor comes in, and uh, um, I'm going to do my very best not to name vendor names, not because I'm going to slam on them, but when I did this at the Senate, and uh, they said, you know, well, can you give us an example of uh, disruption, disrupting service? And I said, well, let's, let's, let's assume you break into MCI. Um, you know, they're a large organization. Any large organization is break into a bull. It's a scalability problem. Next thing you know, I've got Dale Drew, you know, sending me emails going, we're suing your ass. Uh, it was theoretical. So I'm going to do my best. No, I already blew it. I already mentioned MCI. Fine. <laughs> well... The, the, the notion of plausible deniability and buck passing, uh, oh, thanks, is, you know, if, if somebody comes in and says, if, you know, use our product, then the vendor can say, you see, we're following industry standards. We have Firewall 1. We have Sunscreen. We have, you know, um, uh, Sidewinder, you know, in place. These are firewalls. It doesn't mean anything. It just means that you now have an appearance of security, which is arguably much more dangerous than having real security or the lack thereof. So, um, oh, then the final one is a lot of these large organizations don't believe that their products actually have anything to do with security. Uh, not mentioning company names again, uh, I guess, uh, was it Rational Software makes a clear case? 
Uh, and I came out with an advisory a while back because I saw that they had roughly a six meg executable that will set UID root. And I said, that's almost impossible to secure. Um, and if you look around, you will find a lot of large software vendors distributing set UID root binaries. I believe uh, BMC Patrol has a six meg and eight meg set UID root, root binaries floating around in the systems. Nobody else heard that? Okay. <laughs> Vegas is a little too surreal for me. Um, and they say, well, what it is, is it, it's basically uh, a CVS uh, revision control system on steroids with a nice GUI around it um, that has no, no need to do security, so we're not a security company. Why should we spend time looking at it? Well, you're making a big assumption at that point that anywhere you put it into doesn't care about security also. Because now you're talking about developers and you have no clue what sort of code they're writing and you have no clue who wants to get onto those machines to see the sort of code that they're writing. Um, should somebody get on there, they're going to look around for any avenue of attack they have. If you know, your vendor says, well, geez, I, I just do you know, RCS, SCCS, you know, CVS type tools, that's not a security thing, but they open up the security of your system, I think they're to blame and I think that's a, a real shortcoming. And people need to start looking at the, the security of their products, even if it has no overtly um, you know, obvious connotations of... of can, can we just turn that thing entirely off? Thanks. Um, yeah, whatever I was saying. <laughs> so, next slide. Over to the developers. God bless the developers. <laughs> and God bless the project directors that don't let them do anything relating to security. Um, Project directors and managers and everybody who wants to come out with a, some sort of product uh, quickly, security is going to get in the way. Doing, thing right, doing things right is what they all want to do. However, um, doing things right and making it to market very quickly to make money are, are oftentimes diametrically opposed to each other. Since businesses are in the you know, job of making money, you can, you can imagine which one wins. So of course, quick fixes are always easier than a thorough understanding of the problem. And with the quick fixes and uh, with implementing things, whatever the first solution is, it's permanent. As soon as it works, it's frozen. And getting people to come back and fix stuff, you don't want to be sitting there at Microsoft and say, yes, we have to take our, you know, cool hotshot uh, programmers and coders off of the latest bells and whistles to go back and clean stuff up from before because that's not revenue generating. And besides, if none of our, if none of our clients or vendors or uh, the people running our software are complaining about the security problem, why should we bother fixing it? Well, mostly because they don't know the problems there and the large uh, developers or the large uh, vendors are actually just keeping the, uh, keeping the customers in the dark about it. Um, then there's the whole notion of education and schooling. And I, I, I went and I took a look at a few courses over at uh, some of the Boston colleges uh, relatively recently for the coding stuff. And I approached the, the uh, professors and said, hey, you know, do you mind, can I just sit in there and see your course notes and see, uh, see how you're going to be teaching the class? And they said, sure. And they are training people to write code in insecure fashions. So they come out of school or they come out of whatever and they think that using system and popen and uh, exec uh, VPs, anything following paths and uh, not using explicit paths in the commands and using make temp and just sitting there and leaving turds all over temp directories is absolutely fine. And they get A's and they're rewarded and they're encouraged to do this. And then they come into the real world and they're doing this and, and that's, that's the standard. Now you have to untrain all of these people. And that's difficult. It took them how many years to go through college? Uh, okay, peer review. Peer review never seems to happen from a security perspective. It's a real shame. Bruce was talking about this yesterday. Um, everybody screams bloody murder. We do great Q&A. We do great uh, regression testing. Microsoft said, you know, well, geez, why didn't anybody point out these, uh, these security bugs? It's not like we didn't beta test the stuff. We had a huge beta test team. This was when 4.0 first came out. Well, beta testing and looking for security bugs are two completely separate things. So there, now I've stolen something from you, Bruce. <laughs> Um, let's see, anything else? Yes, the, uh, the corollary to the uh, first solution is always permanent is that the quick and dirty solutions are always permanent also. Uh, ISPs and managed firewalls. Next slide, please.
How many people here work for an ISP? <laughs> Nobody works for an ISP here. I love it. <laughs> okay, two. <laughs> you. Does, does your ISP ever market anything as secure or use the word security in their stuff? Yes, they do. Wow. How about you back there? Absolutely. Is there any real security? <laughs> you rock, Kelly. <laughs> um, every ISP, because all the customers are sitting there and looking at all the media and they're saying, oh, hackers are out to get you, the whole world is falling apart. Um, and they say, well, you know, we've got security. You know, we are a secure ISP. We care about all of this. Putting security and restricting people's access is anathema to what an ISP is trying to do, which is to provide ubiquitous access to everything. It doesn't happen. Um, when it does happen, it's entirely marketing from what I've seen, or it's the salespeople wanting to give warm fuzzies, and then you come back in and you're like, holy good God. When, when we talked about taking down the internet in, in 30 minutes as all the buzzwords and the media picked up at the Senate, that was entirely because the stuff at the maze and the routers and everything, their job is to move packets very quickly. Their job is not to filter and block things. Filtering and blocking things slows things down. Everybody wants to move to, you know, 100 megabit OC3s, OC2s, 12s, you know, gigabit backplanes inside of their actual local NOC or their, their local ISP environment. This is not conducive to restricting and putting filters in place and analyzing and looking at every single packet. Um, then you have the, the ISPs that do like managed firewalls. And you look at them and, and the, some of the reasons that you might go to one of these ISPs is that you don't have, because you, you're that large organization or you're a medium-sized organization, and you don't have the internal security uh, expertise. And you've tried to hire these people, and you can't find them. I mean, there aren't a tremendous amount of really savvy, knowledgeable people out there you know, in the field that aren't gainfully employed already. You know, so you give up and you say, fine, you know, company Foo over there is offering a managed firewall. They put it in place, they read the logs, they do everything, they audit it. This is great. Well, I've seen these companies that are doing these managed firewalls and they have the same problems. They can't find anybody out there. They can't hire the people. Oh, sure, they've hired, you know, a $250,000 security expert. They've got Dan Farmer, Marcus Raynham, and Cheswick and Bellavan all sitting around there staring at your logs. <laughs> I don't think so, but uh, nonetheless, I mean, there, there's a big demand for it and people, people will pay for that and they don't realize that the problem is across the board. Everybody has this problem and, and when a managed firewall vendor says, yep, we can do this for $20,000 a year, that saves you the price of hiring a full-time security expert, you got to wonder how they got around the problem. So, next slide. The government agencies. Um, they have a really unique situation here because they fall under just about every other umbrella. Um, they are huge. They are extremely large-scale in installations. They have more legacy stuff than you can ever shake a stick at. Um, you know, you look at some of the old networks and you wonder why Milnet hasn't gone away. You know, you wonder why DSINet's still sitting there strang straggling around over in Germany. You know, and it, it can't. It's just, there are, there are so many things that the large government agencies have to fight with, and it's almost, it's almost an impossible um, uh, task for them to go through. But we'll point out a couple of the things here that really, really stick out. The legacy systems are impossible. Um, then there's the fact that you've been doing this now since, you know, the early 70s, and you know, especially the agencies that were involved with DARPA and some of the other places that really wanted to set up early computer systems. And once you get something in place and it starts working, it's very difficult to, uh, to change that. Um, what I was told by one of my military friends not to mention is also that nobody wants to rock the boat and actually implement or instigate or start the changes because it's your head on the chopping block. Uh, the other cool thing about it is that a lot of these agencies really worked in an academic type environment. I mean, I will, I will lump NASA in as a government agency. Uh, I know there's, you, know, you can argue about that. But uh, it was, it was, it's entirely spreading and sharing information. Well, that's not security conscious. Is that a problem? No, I think it's really cool. I love the amount of information that NASA gives out in a good way. Um, and 
a lot of these other agencies really needed to be open also. So how do you how do you actually put security on top of that? Then there are the agencies that are just now making the paradigm shift behind the curve. Uh, look at some of the investigative agencies where it was really uncouth and unhip to be uh, saddled or burdened with a desk job to look through logs to make these phone calls. You wanted to be out, you know, actually in the field. You know, that was a much more romantic, exciting, you know, sought after job. And then there are the really interesting agencies that are so compartmentalized that they're not allowed to share anything and um, one of them actually pulled me and a couple other people in this room in to do some training and it was rather humorous because I'm looking at them going, you guys should probably, I should probably be begging you to train me, um, but you're not allowed to walk down three doors and knock on this other guy's door who knows all this stuff cold. Because it's a different group. Next slide. Oh, security vendors. The wheat from the chaff. See the developer slide. Uh, see the developer slide and then imagine that there's this huge market um, for w with people just waiting to hand, hand money and they have no clue what they're getting but they're still going to hand out money anyway. I mean, what are you going to do? If, you'll see, those of you who are, I should have worn the shirt today. Oh, you have one on? Want to stand up and model? <laughs> this, this is the new, we've decided the uh, loft is now going to completely sell out and we are going to join the mainstream and we're going to sell snake oil too. So we have the new loft crack t-shirts here and on the back you can see the little medicine bottle uh, saying, you know, makes the weak strong. Um, let's see. One part curiously bad crypto, one part dictionary passwords, two parts legacy support, five parts optimized assembly code. Warning, the enforced threat to provide a password. Uh, the attractive terms of the fine art of the obfuscation. So. <laughs> We figure that all the other vendors are actually dressing this stuff up to make it look legitimate and it turns out that a, a large portion of them are really snake oil. We figured if we made ourselves look like snake oil, people must assume that we're actually legitimate. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, the other, the other thing is, have, have you really thought about what these security vendors have to actually provide you? The security, does anybody have, I mean, if we go over to, to, the, to the young lady from the ISP and say, is your security problem the exact same thing as, you know, this man over here from some sort of, you know, security council, from, you know, Ford trying to protect their actual assembly lines? No, you have completely different environments, completely different systems, and completely different security constraints that you need to enforce. Yet, everybody wants this one magic tool, this one silver bullet from all the different security vendors that out of the box works in all of these environments. And not only that, it needs to take this data, which can actually be relatively difficult to try and explain to somebody. I mean, some of the reporters come up and they're like, oh, so, you know, how's loft crack work? And I go, oh, well, the land man hash is really funny because it's broken up into these two parts and then they actually salt it. So it's like, instant glaze over of the eyes. But that's what these security tools are really trying to tell you. And they have to put it in simple enough forms and simple enough manner that the middle management and upper management people can actually make sense of it and say, oh, that means this is bad. You know, this is good. Red light, green light. Red light, green light. <laughs> it, that, that's a tough task to do. I mean, I don't, I mean, ISS and, and CyberCop Scanner and what, whatever other like auditing tools that are out there, I mean, they have a very difficult job to do. So whether or not they do it, you know, uh, who does it better, I, I don't know anymore, but uh, it, it is something to think about. And then there's the, uh, and here, here's my other one stolen from Mr. Schneier. Uh, customers all want security, but they're all unwilling to pay for it. So can I do it? Can I do the little, uh, all right. How many people out here, this normally doesn't work in entirely government filled rooms, and I'll tell you why in a moment. How many people out there value your privacy and security? Raise of hands. All right, how many of you giving me the infamous evil hacker mudge from that horrible group, The Loft, up in Boston, your social security number. Yeah, all the government people go, you can get it anyway. You know, it's all public. Yeah. I, I did this once at a government organization, and I'm like, okay, that was a bad example. How many of you would tell me exactly how much you make? And they're all like, oh, yeah, it's all public knowledge also. I'm like, ah! <laughs> 
But uh, you know, how, how many would, t would tell me if you, you know, own a house or rent a house? Uh, you know, what you've pers you know, recently bought. Have you ever noticed that, you know, if you're, let's say, you know, a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant male in your 20s to 30s, that you never get junk mail marketing for uh, 50 or 60 year old African American pregnant women? <laughs> 50 or 60 year old African American pregnant women get targeted marking for uh, for new baby toys and everything. You know, this this is all information security. So you're you're all telling me that you value your privacy and you value your security. How much is it worth to you? How many people go into these grocery stores, and for the equivalent of 5% off of your total bill, will fill out the form giving them basically your social security number, your income range, whether you own or lease your house, what area you live in, to get that little advantage card. All right, how many people have the advantage cards from those grocery stores? Be honest. <laughs> and that saved you probably two or three dollars at the grocery store, and you're telling me that all that information is worth two or three dollars to you, and that's what you're telling the security vendors. So, next slide. Now the fun stuff. Okay, so we, we've beaten over the head all the stuff that everybody knows. The problem you didn't want to see. What are you protecting against? Well, I know a lot of these organizations would absolutely shit themselves if they thought that their source code was floating around in the underground. Well, guess what it is? Absolutely beyond a shadow of a doubt. And I was surprised how few people realize this and how few people realize that it's being traded left and right on IRC every single day. And you sit there and you see like people like, yo, DCC me Solaris, yo, DCC me, uh, you know, whatever operating system, foo, operating system bar. And there goes this big old targ zip file. <laughs> and I was talking to this, this group that was trying to do like network intrusion detection. They were trying to set up firewalls in a, for, uh, for their own environment. And they said, well, you know, it's a good thing that the, the you know, we, we can't get the source code to, to take a look and fix the operating system. But at least if we can't get it, the hackers can't get it either. I say, the only thing protecting you is that most of these hackers traded around as these huge tarballs that sit on their hard drive and it's just cool to have and they don't know what the hell to do with it. Then of course you do get some of them that actually do know what to do with it. Um, but those are the guys that probably aren't going to be defacing your website anyway. They want, they, they're looking for particular problems. The bad guys have the source. Um, Sun and Microsoft are great examples. I mean, both of them really probably don't believe that their source code's out there and floating around. Yet both of them have given their entire source trees to universities. You know, universities, let's go back to this academic environment, for, you know, sharing information, sharing knowledge. Students, <laughs> the most trustworthy people in the world. <laughs> yeah. So, let's see, anything else? Okay, except it's out there. Oh yeah, um, legal steps are being taken to make it more difficult for people like my group, um, the loft, to actually try and do good things. Now, if you look at HR 514, House of uh, Representatives bill that was passed, that basically says it's illegal to decode any digital transmission, whether it's scrambled or not. You know, if you look at a uh, WIPO, you know, geez, if you reverse engineer it and it wasn't your software in the first place, you know, you're breaking the law. Yeah, you can't sniff. I, I, I'll tell you what happens. If, if HR 514 and WIPO become really, really, you know, prominent and prevalent in uh, industry and society, I'm going to start writing viruses. Because that way McAfee and Symantec and Norton and all those folks are basically reverse engineering my viruses in order to scan for them. <laughs> Think about it. This is really silly. This is, this is Ford, you know, building a car and presenting it to you with the, with the hood welded shut and saying, A, no user serviceable parts inside, and uh, B, you know, you have no reason or right to learn how this is working. Never mind the fact that when you strap yourself behind the wheel, you're trusting your life to us. So uh, that's been the, the large thing where we've been going to the, uh, the, the political people saying, look, you know, you can't do this. This is really, really bad. Uh, I mean, this, this is directly opposed to how um, uh, patents work. The entire patent mechanism is so that you share information and other people can learn from it and improve upon it. You know, that's how the world progresses. But uh, lobbyists, you know, are very powerful and have a lot of money and it takes a lot of work to undo that. So next, next page.
the whole education thing. I mean, everybody screams education. If everybody was educated, we wouldn't have this problem. If everybody thought about security, they wouldn't have this problem. Um, education's tough. People will always take the easiest route out, and people don't want to be saddled with going through the classes. I mean, we, somebody mentioned the other day how many people, I think it was you, how many people skip out on the uh, human resources orientation, how many people have skipped out on the you know, uh, sexual harassment in the workplaces classes. I mean, I went, but I just thought it was a how-to course. You know, it was one of those. <laughs> and they made me sign my little name, and you know. Um, Education's really, really, really tough. I'm, I'm not going to rat hold down that one. Uh, I've seen a lot of organizations do the fear, uncertainty, doubt videos where they like hire somebody to jump in their garbage cans and sit there and root through papers and go, "This is what you're protecting against." Um, you know, I, I don't like those. Guessable passwords, as the, the famous PPTP paper uh, pointed out, people are extremely poor sources of entropy. Um, Oh, well, I believe Root Shell, when Root Shell was hacked, uh, I believe, uh, um, you know, Satomo, when um, he was hacked at uh, SDSC, you know, these are security bright people. Uh, when Marcus yesterday commented on, uh, he was, you know, a relatively paranoid guy and wrote some secure code and had some people, you know, publicly humiliate him, um, it was Casper Dick and myself sitting in the back room that did that. Uh, Marcus is a, is a bright guy, and I think, he's a, I think he's a decent coder. I mean, he is paranoid as hell. Um, what he had done is he, he ran this little demonstration on writing secure code to withstand hostile environments, had about seven slides with source code examples on them, and said, if anybody can find a security problem in these, I'll buy you a beer. Well, by the end of the day, this was like three years ago, four years ago at Usenix Security Symposium, by the end of the day, Casper Dick and myself had a case of beer between us at the, uh, at the end of the table. You know, these are bright people, but the, uh, the root shell and the Tsutomo thing, what happens there? People telnet into a place to then SSH into somewhere else, or people like, you know, went up to their ISP and their ISP was compromised, and then they used secure mechanisms to get into their corporation. I mean, it's an education that you can't win, and, and people, people don't think about how things work. Uh, there's the whole people don't just attack the encrypted communication streams, you know, the data is being protected in transit, you know, but what happens afterwards? There was, a, and, and my bottom one is one of the, my favorite ones, Loftcrack, you know, is like the shareware thing. And um, the only reason it's shareware is because a couple of large government organiza organizations had deployed it as a de facto standard auditing tool and wouldn't give us $50. Um, so we said timeout mechanism, and instantly we realized how many people were actually using it, so we were happy. Uh, and we went out and bought a lot of beer. Uh, the <laughs> and, and now we're broke again. But anyway, uh, they, a lot of these government agencies can't use their credit cards or their government credit cards over the net. And I think this is kind of neat. Um, you know, I, I use my credit card over the net all the time. I won't use my bank card to save my life over the net. You know, there was this, this whole, you know, limited liability notion there. And they said, do you have some way, you know, can we call up and give it to you over the phone? So we were dealing with a couple of different uh, credit card clearing houses to do this. And we said, hey, you know, will you be able to offer this? Because some people want to, you know, give us the 50 bucks. It's now 100 bucks inflation. Um, to, you know, they want to give their credit cards that way. And they said, sure, you know, yeah, we'll, we'll do that. So what do you think they did? Now they pick up the phone, answer it, and uh, get the c credit card number, and then they actually web in to their server. They're at different geographic locations. They're going over the entire internet to plug the credit card stuff in. But at least government agencies can buy the uh, software now that way. <laughs> so some corporate paradigms that don't work, and then we'll get on to the, the, the fun parts and try, and try and make people leave here with a smile and a song in their heart. Um, Okay, and I've seen these all at various uh, places that I've either contracted for or worked at. Um, management obviously looking for marketing dollars. We've got this really kick-ass firewall. Um, you know, your competitor just bought it. Uh, they're running behind it. You know, I don't know what you're running behind, but what are your customers going to do when you ask them how you protect yourselves? You know, if you are not running firewall one, you're nobody. You know, nobody else has heard of anything other than Firewall 1, so you want to have that name. Not saying Firewall 1's bad, not saying it's good. You know, oh well, you know, John bought a bigger car than me, so I gotta go buy the same car, otherwise I'm just not hip and I'm not doing industry standard due diligence. It's, it's window dressing. 
it's entirely window dressing. And whoever, whichever company has the most marketing money and sales money to send out to get to this level of people, because we've learned this the hard way trying to make Loft pay for itself, it takes a lot of money to actually go try and sell stuff to people. And we don't have that. We're, we're a bunch of hackers that you know, want to basically disseminate information, which is another thing that is you know, directly opposed to making money, it seems. Um, then the, there's the companies that say that the solution has to be completely supported and they will never look at anything shareware or freeware to save their lives. And I can understand that from some stances. I mean, you don't want something breaking that's completely homegrown, internal, uh, and the guy who wrote it you know, took off and you know, documented it says, read the source code. The uh, caveat to that is there are, there are people that sit there and say you know, in management, well, if you don't like the way these commercial things are, we've got all the toolkits to write it ourselves. You know, that doesn't work by itself. Uh, middle management dictating security never works because as soon as you're in an organization and you're in charge of security for a large amount of other organizations and you say this is what we need to do, somebody in sub-business unit across the hall says, you know, much is making my life difficult, I'm going to get my manager who outranks his manager to go over and open up the firewall or to undo all the security stuff. You don't want to be spending your energy fighting those battles. You have better ones to work on. Um, and then there's the, the grassroots fashion of security from the ground up. Well, just, you know, this is the inverse pyramid. This is the pyramid standing at it, uh, on top of its apex as opposed to working from the top down. And it goes in every single direction and everybody believes that they have the best way to do security. Uh, then there's the entire, it's the least important aspect of the corporation, that doesn't work. And if it's the most important aspect of the corporation, they're not going to make any money. So the next slide, please. Here are some that I have seen work. Uh, I did work at a large R&D organization for um, a few years, and I am extremely happy uh, about what we were able to do. And what we were able to do is we were able to take an environment with about 50 to 60,000 systems and actually put some notion of security around it. So we took a system that was entirely open to the internet, older academic, you know, government R&D grant type money things, and well, first off, we yanked them off the net, uh, and then we actually put stuff in place. And the only reason that it was possible to do that was that upper management was completely behind us. And they knew that we weren't going to run and kick and shout and say, no, you can't let that business unit you know, do this. And the business unit's making $30 billion a year. And they say, well, what happens if it breaks in? Oh, well, it'll cost us you know, a day of downtime, which is $2,000. Know, that doesn't work. But when, when upper management said, OK, we're behind you, and we will help you push, and we will fight the battles for you politically. You just do the good work. And we actually put this entire organization into some notion of security. It's not perfect. You can't make a perfect security thing where that many people need in and out. But from zero to 50, I mean, that was a big raise of bars, and the ankle biters flat out disappeared. And from that point on, we spent a lot more time looking at the really neat hacks that were coming against us. And honestly, that's where the excitement and the fun is. And that's where you learn how things work, too. Um, let's see. Okay, there, <laughs> one, two, three, four. The fifth bullet down, which seems to make no sense whatsoever. Uh, tools and methods declarations take input from the technical components deploying and using the software. Often the influence should be gleaned from what tools have infiltrated into that level as de facto standard. What that means is, as opposed to just doing the middle management, um, you know, who has the, mo the biggest marketing dollars, you need to do a two-pronged approach. You need to get tools out there, and you need to have the technical people actually deploying and using your tools, because the technical people are going to throw away stuff that they don't want to use, and they're going to use the stuff that's actually giving them good, re good rewards or good returns. If you are upper management or middle management, go around and talk to the techies and see how they're doing things, and then see what you can do to get some of those tools distributed in a more corporate-wide fashion. You know, this, this works better than just saying, thou shalt use foo, you know, and trying to force everybody to use it. And it also works better than just letting all the lower uh, business units, you know, grassroots up in every, you know, whatever direction. And I've seen that used very successfully in organizations. Um, yeah, employees are incented, and I don't know if incented is really a word, uh, to improve security in all jobs. Um, I've, uh, we've had people who... Uh, have written to us saying, hey, we found this great way of doing things. And what we're doing is we hold contests with the security stuff. And with something like Loftcrack, this was one example of an email. And I said, well, yeah, it does get all the passwords back. 
Um, but people who are the last ones that it cracks, signifying that somehow they used a better form of entropy and it had to actually go through a lot of the brute force stuff, um, you know, we're giving them a chip for dinner. Or we're, you know, we're rewarding them somehow. And, and you're encouraging the people to do things. One of my favorites, and I think it's in a different slide, is if you start looking at things from a security standpoint, you understand the technology you're deploying. All industries need to do this. I don't know how many industries I go to, and you ask them what the product is, and they have all this marketing rhetoric, and they have no clue what the tool actually does. You know, if they think about security, they'll understand what they're, uh, what they're dealing with. And then the whole uh, corporations need to really show the vendors uh, you know, that, that they are willing to pay for security and that they, they could care less about the window dressing and they're coming in to bust me. And we've got... All right, Jeff, this is a setup, huh? Get Mudge down to Vegas and call the cops. Thanks. <laughs> no. Um... <laughs> Paging Mr. Ted Hurdy. Ted Hurdy. Anywhere? <laughs> yes. Is that a Ted Hurdy? <laughs> no problem. And the loft escapes narrowly again. <laughs> Make, make your security focus enforceable by human resources. Now, be really careful with this one because we also get people sending us email going, uh, we were surfing your web page and uh, we had some of the exploits and now I'm fired. <laughs> we've gotten that and we've been, you know, I'm, I'm sitting there always looking at it going, well, I hope that it's really not bad out, that bad out there. Uh, and I also realize that a lot of times there's a bunch of stuff I don't understand. Like the guy was probably, you know, busted for like stealing equipment also and they've been building some, you know, dossier on him for a while or some docket. But uh, if it's not enforceable by HR and people, you know, continually violate the policies and you can't do anything other than slap their wrists, you don't send any message out. And so it's a really double-edged sword. But it needs to be, it needs to be balanced. Next slide. That's cool. I only duplicated on the printing. Let's see. Context, switch your mindset. <laughs> Some spook came up to us uh, a little while ago, and uh, we were all out having dinner. And uh, the spook was telling us about this little tour he got of an ISP who had their knock built in a bomb shelter under a golf course. And he said, look, you know, we're, uh, you know, we're all set, you know. We'll, you can drop nuclear bombs all around us and, you know, we'll keep pumping out packets. And the, the, sp the, spook, uh, the spook was sitting there laughing, you know, took another sip off his beer and said, uh, yeah, I was just, it was cracking me up. They were ready for the last world war. And, of course, all the guys at the loft were like, last world war? <laughs> what, what you mean last world war? As if, you know, this, when's this next world war coming and where do we need to go? Um, but that's exactly what it was. You know, you need to get out of that, you know, hey, I'm, I'm protecting against, you know, uh, big massive tanks driving up to my, you know, door. You know, the heck with that. I'm just going to, you know, pilot this itty bitty, who, who hears from Sandia National Labs? <laughs> ah, do you still have the cool pictures of all the little robots with the treads? Ah. <laughs> You're not going to see this thing running around in the sand looking for trace particles. You know, this, this is a new mindset. And I'm, I'm, I am told over and over again that that's public information. Because you're all doing the micro-machining stuff, so good. <laughs> Get the cop back up here, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, a lot of people don't understand that writing secure code uh, is, is, you know, something that promotes maintainability of the code. It's, you know, what, what's, what's the worst part about um, code? How, how can you make uh, code and almost guarantee that it's insecure, writing code? Anybody? <laughs> Don't comment it. <laughs> that doesn't necessarily mean it's insecure. Um, it just means it's, it's, it's more difficult to maintain. Make it as complex and as confusing and as whiz-bang, neato way of, of coming up and doing something. As soon as you introduce complexity, you raise the uh, percentage of, you know, of, of finding a vulnerability or, or introducing a bug in it. 
security security code is great. I'm I'm not a great coder by any means. I like to think I'm I'm uh, paranoid. I have a great coder working over at the loft. Uh, he does a lot of whiz bang stuff, and I'm sure I'm going to bust him on it at one point or another. But uh, one of the reasons I like security is that writing secure code means you make it as simple and as straightforward as possible. It's easier to write, less chance of fucking up, and you know less chance of introducing bugs. It's also very readable at that point. I can go back at it, and I don't even need the comments in my code sometimes. And I go like, I know what I was doing. <laughs> and I messed it up, yes. Um, yeah, fixing and preventing what many people believe are not security-related bugs. You know, my, Microsoft and some other places were beautiful with this. Well, it's not a security bug, it just crashes. <laughs> it's not a security bug because the person didn't realize they were overriding the instruction pointer in the save stack frame and it just, you know, blue screen because it was in kernel mode. Hmm, not a security bug. Not yet. So, again, if you're thinking about security, then you're thinking about the technology you deploy. So the next, next slide. And I'll try and wrap this up a little more quickly. Ah, the thinking creatively and trying to break everything that you come across. This, this, is, this is the doctrine of the loft. You know, if you see something, figure it out. Rip it apart. You know, hopefully you can put it back together again. Uh, answering machines are one of my favorite things as a, as a uh, demonstrable uh, component in your life that, excuse me, you need to understand, you know. Why, why are answering machines, why do they have any sort of notion of security? Why can I say that uh, an answering machine is a security object? Because you have personal messages on there, you don't want to know Yep, you have some personal data that's stored on it, and maybe you don't want that private. Does it, uh, does it have any sort of certificate? Does, does it authenticate who you are? When somebody calls up and they get your answering machine, and it's your voice on it, that is basically representing your persona. If you were to take an answering machine and record, yes operator, this number accepts reverse billing and collect call charges, what does the operator do? Does that give the operator the authority to actually do the reverse billing and collect calls to your number? Absolutely. I don't know if they're supposed to or not. I imagine they probably are. I hear a lot of business uh, answering machines that do that. Um, this thing has some notion of identity and some notion of security. If it didn't, why would you need little access numbers to get your messages back? And have you ever thought about how these access numbers actually work? I mean, what we'll say a standard is like four digits. Most <laughs> three. <laughs> Somebody laughed. Ha, <laughs> two, <laughs> one. <laughs> I call it up, you can't even leave messages. It just spits all the ones out at you. <laughs> um, have you ever thought about what happens if, you're, if your four digit code is one, two, three, four? I mean, when they're selling these answering machines, security isn't the foremost thing in their mind. They just want to put some sort of PIN number on it. You ever think that they might take the easiest way out and just do it as registers? And that basically, as soon as the numbers one, two, three, and four, each time one of those is tripped with the DTMF, that it just sets a bit saying, got that value? Well, what happens then if it's done out of order? If you do 4321, you still set all the bits. And when it goes back and looks and says, are all the bits set? Can I play these uh, messages back? The answer is yes. I mean, uh, there was a, a post a while back where somebody went to Radio Shack and got one of the little touchstone dialers and programmed it in to cycle through 0 through 9 about seven times really quickly. And he'd call up, and anybody's answer machine he wanted, it would just go, you have seven messages. First message playing. <laughs> You need to, when, when somebody says, this is something I'm selling you, this is how it works, don't do that. The first thing you should do is whatever they told you not to. If it breaks, you want to give it back. This is a Ford Pinto. Do not bump into it from the rear. <laughs> you know, then you have the company buy the proverbial, you know, kahunas. And you can say, look, you're liable for this. You sold me something that does not do any form of real due diligence. You did not make an attempt to do what you're saying. So, of course, I mean, then you can do that to all the security and software vendors, right? No. Uh, software vendors are exempt from the common, common code statutes. If Microsoft sells you a piece of software 
to bank your entire financial future on for doing e-commerce and they say it's encryption and it turns out that their encryption is you know rot 13 or just you know maybe they went really uh, really techno and they, they used an XOR and maybe they decided well if once is good twice is better um, <laughs> And you lose all of your money, you go to Microsoft, and what is, I mean, and I apologize, I know there's a bunch of Microsoft people out there. It's not a, a personal attack on Microsoft. They are a good example to use because everybody's familiar with them. Um, you can insert company name, whatever. Uh, so anyway, Microsoft. Uh, <laughs> uh, they, they don't have to give you anything. They don't even have to say they're sorry. This is all the, all the software vendors out there exempt from common code statutes. Uh, so the other caveat to that is, what do you want to do? You want to make software vendors somewhat liable then. If you're risking all of, you know, all of your you know, eggs in the one basket, you want to make sure that that basket is built correctly. Well, as soon as you say liability to lobbyists, to uh, marketing people, to sales people, to lawyers, they say liability, my company will lose money. No, we'll fight it. And as we've all been able to see, extremely large organizations like Microsoft can fight things very well. You know, they have the money and they do that really well. Um, so I implore everybody to not use the word liability, but instead use the word incentives. Because if you provide them with incentives to do the right thing, the marketing, sales, lobbyists, uh, lawyers and everything say, incentives, we can make money off of that. Our life can be made easier. It's the exact same thing you're going after, but you just need to present it in a different fashion. Car theft systems are great, you know, context with your mindsets. How many people have a uh, LoJack? Cool. I mean, I don't, I don't have any personal problem against the company. I think it, it was somebody came up with a neat idea. But why might I be concerned about having LoJack in my car? <laughs> do, do you think I like key escrow? Here's, here's some, you know, non-partial, friendly other agency that can turn this thing on whenever they want and figure out where I am and do traffic patterns. And if I have to drive through the combat zone in Boston every day to go to work, um, maybe they think that I'm a drug runner. You know, maybe they think that since I go there that I am some uncouth person who just lives at strip joints, you know. <laughs> so I don't have LoJack. <laughs> um, yeah, that I know of. Uh, there's some great LoJack stories like the, uh, and I don't know if this is a rumor or not, but a guy over in Russia, they have this uh, TV series, and if somebody can um, uh, confirm or deny this, this will be great. And they put LoJack in a car, and they have the guy drive, and it's like a Mercedes or a, a expensive Beamer or something. And if the guy can keep away from the authorities that they send out to get him for 30 minutes or 45 minutes, however long it is, he gets to keep the car. So they've had two people um, actually win and keep the cars. Now, of course, the loft said, oh, we should go over to Russia and rig up a little thing that just drives by and sets the low frequency off to trigger everybody else's low jack cars. And of course, then they don't know, you know, which one we are in the wash. But um, <laughs> one guy was a professional racer and he drove to, a, to an air base and basically sat on the tarmac, you know, doing circles as all the cops were following him in the circles for half an hour and he got to keep the car. The second guy just, <laughs> I thought that was kind of hip. We'll get Space Rogue to do that. He's our resident race driver. Um, and the second guy just drove into a big tunnel and parked. <laughs> and then there's the, uh, and I am running over here, I'm, I apologize, uh, the notion of cell phones in HR 514. I mean, the, the, the cell phone industry came out, the phone companies, and said, cell phones are great, we're going to pop them up all over the place, they're going to sit there in the mid-800 megahertz range, and it's all going to be in clear text, and boom. And then when people said, well, hey, you know, we had the, the, the belief that our phone conversations were somewhat private. I mean, this is something, yeah. And the, the cell phone companies went, well, uh, you know, if we could have put, you know, a simple encryption in place. We could have put some sort of authentication mechanism in place, but we didn't. We wanted to get it out there and make money. So now when they need to fix the stuff, what do they do? They lobby and they get HR 514 passed so that people say, it's illegal for you to listen to that. That doesn't stop the bad guys whatsoever. Uh, there are some ways to, uh, to fix this, and one of the ways of fixing it is the next two slides, and that is 
I see a lot of companies going out there and I see a lot of companies saying, you know, we can make money playing catch up and we can do it and we can make money by selling uh, subscription services. You know, so if it's a scanner, if it's a tool base or whatever, you know, each month buy the new subscription service because new vulnerabilities are being pumped out by people like Loft and everybody, so pay us, to, you know, to keep track of it. Well, the vulnerabilities that we're pumping out are, aren't for that purpose, but uh, we seem to be making a lot of other companies a lot of money and soon I'll be a bitter uh, businessman like Marcus Raynham. Uh, <laughs> where's Marcus? I'll be rich like Marcus too. No, uh, <laughs> uh, what we did, uh, and I talked about this at Sands, and somebody, this was the first time I realized this, and somebody pointed out and goes, well, what you're doing, and I don't know if anybody knows this or doesn't know this, but a uh, uh, network flight recorder approached the loft and said, will you write our ID, uh, intrusion detection suite for a network flight recorder? And we said, sure, we'd like to, you know, we'd like to have some uh, cash flow coming into the place, and we liked some of the stuff Marcus did, so we started writing it. And the way we started approaching it was we, we started looking for not, you know, yes, we're going to go through root shell, and yes, we're going to go through packet storm, and yes, we're going to go through our own archives and advisories, and, you know, put all the checks in for there, and yes, we're going to look for whiz and debug because the other vendors look for was in debug, so we're going to spend CPU cycles, and let me tell you that everything is an inner loop, and CPU cycles are extremely important in network intrusion detection systems, so I don't know why people spin them looking for some things. Um, but we try to model things, and we try to be really uh, forward-thinking and say, we don't want to be in the job of providing a subscription service. We don't want Network Flight Recorder or Marcus to come to us and say, well, that was really good, but there's a whole bunch of new ones out here now. You know, can we contract you to write those? And it just basically, that becomes our entire life. So we said, what can we do in different ways that we catch new ones as they come out? And you know, when the EI vulnerability came out, the stuff that was in our you know, intrusion detection stuff already flagged it. We didn't have to touch it. You know, when things, a new thing will come out for like you know, NNTP or SEMmail or whatever, I'm hoping that some of the ways that we've approached this will already grab it. And somebody said, well, you could make a lot more money that other way. Like, yeah, I guess, I guess we really could, but that's not the way we really need to be taking this world if we need to secure it. We need to start thinking more forward and less backwards. So, IDS, let's go to the next page. I'll give you a quick example of that. Uh, thinking, thinking a bit more forward. So we'll say that this is a... Uh, SMTP and NNTP are basically the same protocol. You have a command section, you have a header section, you have an article section. The command section uh, is when you first connect in and you do the hello, mail from, receipt to, xbin, verify, um, turn. I don't know if anybody remembers the wonderful turn command that was introduced to SMTP being take this person's mailbox and redirect all the mail over to this other place. So um, I, I'm, I'm waiting for like Microsoft or somebody else like Exchange to actually implement that in their SMTP proxy. But uh, that's the command section. As soon as you type data, you switch state. You are now instantly in the header section. The header section goes until you have a blank line, in which case that says headers are over. Headers are subject, um, you know, reply to, uh, X authorized or exported agent approved by type blah blah blah. As soon as you have that blank line, it goes into the actual body of the article, and that body of the article goes until you hit, you know, uh, zero A zero D period zero A zero D. So. Why do you look for whiz and debug in anything other than the command section? You know, if you're on a mailing list for Unix developers that also play Dungeons and Dragons, you're going to have a lot of false positives here. You know, as people say, whiz and debug all over the place. You don't want to be looking for uh, receipt to, uh, let's see, what was my UUD code or whatever the uh, the vacation message actually ended up going to that, that would bounce it back in the header section or the article. Actually, it was the reply to was the uh, um, so that would would be looked for in the header section. Here's what here's what you get by modeling state around these applications. And modeling state can be a really powerful tool, and it's a good way of just showing an example of a context shift and and how to approach things. What are two advantages to this that are really important for network intrusion detection? Speed, speed, you're no longer looking for whiz and debug in places that you don't need to. I'm not scanning for, I'm going to ambush the HR person at 5 p.m. and beat them to a fruit juicy pulp over every hello foobar, mail from, you know, receipt to. I'm only looking for that in the article. I am not looking for uh, 
other thing. I'm not looking for whiz and debug inside the actual body of, of the message. And it took some IDS vendors a while to start doing this. The other, and, and, and it created a real problem. And it wasn't just the speed. What's the second thing that it created? A bunch of false positives. If you have too many false positives, it's a useless IDS system. If you're too slow, you drop packets and you miss everything. So. And then the next one is an example of how to, uh, yeah, how to look at things from a different approach. This is a tool that, that we're going to be releasing in a couple of days. Uh, where this is actually the first time we're announcing it. And whoever here is from Network Associates, it's not going to be called Sniffer. Yeah, it is going to be called Anti-Sniff. So that should be okay. This was an older, yeah. <laughs> It turns out Network Associates has a copyright on the word sniffer. Um, <laughs> now everybody's going to beat you up. <laughs> so um, what we decided to do is we said, well, the heck with these scanning tools looking for people who are breaking in when you, you buy ISS or you buy, you know, CyberCup Scan or you buy NetTech or NetTechTV or I don't know all the names of the, the tools out there. And you're looking for potential vulnerabilities in systems. And that tells you if systems are potentially vulnerable or not. It doesn't tell you that, yes, the system was compromised and it was broken into. You get some host-based systems that then say, you know, okay, well, we're going to look and, well, geez, you've got a bunch of, you know, uh, UID zeros inside of your password file. You've got a bunch of set UID root programs floating around, and maybe some of them are actually even bright enough to say, guess what? That's the exact same size as bin SH. Um, that's a good example that you've been uh, broken into, but it is at the end node, and you actually have to go throw this software onto each one of them. And as soon as you get to a 400,000 system uh, environment, that's impossible. End node security does not scale that far. So we said, what are we going to do? Because um, we were playing around with some stuff, and I believe I saw Tom Patechik uh, and Tim Newsham discussing some stuff on comp security, Unix, or, or whatever. And they said, and they were having an argument with some guy uh, about whether it was possible to detect if a machine was in promiscuous mode on the network without actually ever logging into the system and doing an ifconfig or anything like that. And a bunch of people were saying, no, it's absolutely impossible. And a bunch of people were saying, yes, it is absolutely possible. And uh, what we've done is we decided to actually prove, yet again, making the theoretical practical, that it is extremely possible and it works very well. So some of the ways that we actually do, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. Why would it be important to know if a machine's in promiscuous mode? Sniffing yeah, people sniffing traffic. I mean, what's, has anybody here ever done a penetration test or, uh, you know, a real full-blown one? Like, you really have fun doing it? Yeah. You could raise your hands. You <laughs> think they're just like, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> um, what's one of the first things you do when you get on a machine? Sniff. You sniff. You don't want to sit there and go after every individual machine and try every bug to get in. No, as soon as you sniff, you're going to get all the passwords for everybody else's machine because now you're in the soft, mushy inside behind the hard candy coaty out, you know, cover, and you get all this free work done for you. You go out, you have a few beers, you know, you smoke a cigarette, and you come back the next day, and it's like, boom, now I own the rest of their network. That was tough work. So, we, uh, there, there are, there are, and I'll, I'll give away. It's going to be a shareware type product, kind of like Loftcrack, and we're not going to give source code away to this one because we wrote it as a Windows 9598 NT GUI, and Tatter Loman had the great line of saying, whatever I write for Unix, I will give away for free with source, but if you make me do Windows programming, you have to pay me to do it. <laughs> With, with that being said, what we will be doing to provide along with it, because if we just went and sold something commercially, that really wouldn't be in the vein of what the loft is all about, um, is we are providing all the technical details on exactly how we do this so that anybody else who wants to can write their own, um, or they can take the information they can learn from it and implement it. Uh, Linux boxes have the particular problem in some kernels that if you send a, uh, a bogus MAC address with the correct IP address, uh, it actually responds to it when they're promiscuous and not when they're not. NetBSD has a problem that a lot of people didn't realize, which is the same thing happens, but you have to have a broadcast IP ad address inside of it because it takes a different path in the kernel. Um, Windows has a very interesting one, which we'll have to document, but I'm not going to give away right now because it's just too, too much fun. All the Windows boxes will basically say, I'm in promiscuous mode or I'm not in promiscuous mode uh, if they're using Microsoft drivers. Um, then there are the uh, ones where you send off uh, traffic across the network with um, bogus MAC addresses so that nobody actually answers it, and IP addresses inside, and you look to see who does reverse DNS lookups on it. Those people are obviously sniffing. Uh, then the really cool one, and the, and, and the GUI is, is, is really kind of hip. Um, <laughs> I can't wait till we release that. 
uh, the, the, the other one is what we do is a bunch of time-based deltas. If you're not in promiscuous mode, the actual NIC in your system is blocking all the stuff that's not to you. It never even gets handed to the kernel. So what you do is you ping this person, or you put some sort of nanosecond resolution timer inside the ICMP packet. You get the response back and you say, oh, delta is X. And then you start flooding the network with extremely bogus traffic, and you start pinging the person at the same time again. And you say, delta is X and a half. Okay, little bit of extra added latency, no big deal. Promiscuous mode, you lose this hardware layer filtering, and what happens is everything is handed over to the kernel. Depending on the type of sniffer that you're using, it then is handed in the user land because it wants to grab telnet passwords and everything else, and guess what? That's a context shift from uh, kernel mode to user mode, and that's a big time constraint also. So we send a bunch of traffic across the network. We send a bunch of fake three-way handshakes between non-existent machines that are then actually logging into other systems and transferring files and doing it, and it doesn't exist. But these sniffers and everything go absolutely nuts going, oh, God, I'm raping this network, yeah! And um, now when I ping you, I get about five orders of magnitude increase uh, latency. And the little bells and whistles go off, and you see this nice blip, blip, you know, and the person's in promiscuous mode. And when I was at one of these uh, uh, consulting jobs, I decided to run it inside on. They had a really large... Um, uh, you know, kind of give away who they are by saying this huge flat class B network um, that they used. And it was all bridged and just hubs. It was really wonderful for this sort of tool. Uh, and I'd start calling up people and going, why, why are you sniffing the network? And you should have seen the reason. What? what, what, what? <laughs> not, not, not me. Not me. Oh, you just stopped. <laughs> <laughs> So what this is, this is not a sales pitch for any sniffer, but this is saying you don't have to play reactive. There are a whole bunch of new ways to look for analysis and look for patterns and look for problems on the network and look forward thinking. And it's good to know when people are actually sniffing the network, whether it's for malicious intents or whether it's somebody doing a debugging station uh, trying to find some network problem. So, and much like any other loft tool, it can be used for good and it can be used for evil. The good guys can find out, you know, who's compromised their network or who's sniffing on the network. The bad guys can find out where the network intrusion detection boxes are or to see who else is broken into a network. You know, maybe somebody's on your turf. And if they're sloppier than you are, you want to get out of there because they're going to attract attention. Okay. So the last slide, and jeez, I really ran. Um, everybody, everybody sits there and says, you might be up the creek without a paddle. And, you know, I have not seen a canoe that basically being without a paddle, you know, really uh, degrades your, your quality of life or quality of service tremendously. So, no, there is no silver bullet out there. Stop looking for it. Stop trying to get these vendors to do it. And I, you know, oh, Cheswick's going to kill me for this one. Um, I was uh, out a while back, and I was out with Cheswick, and um, Bellevin there was, and Matt Blaze were there, and they're having this big discussion on how they didn't like something in um, the uh, extremely large number generator, libgmp, in SSH. And because of that, basically their entire gist went, you know, throw SSH out and go back to using Telnet. These are brilliant people. These are people I look up to like you wouldn't believe. And they, they, were, they were honestly like that. Well, there's a, there's a slight problem in here, so throw that one all out. They're academic people. And they, their job is to look for that silver bullet, and they can do that. But don't take that mindset inside of the corporate world and throw away any useful security that you have because it's got a chink in the armor and just take all the armor off. You know, it's better than nothing. Uh, oh, my, my second one was, I love this. Give yourself the warm fuzzies. Get the brains internally. Don't outsource all this stuff. When a vendor comes in and sells you something, you know, pull in some savvy people in your organization that do reverse engineer stuff. The more organizations that do this reverse engineering in-house and everything, the more difficult it's going to be for them to pass extremely bad laws stopping people from learning. Uh, and also when the vendors come in, you can sit there and say, well, you know, let's take a look at it. And when you do find the problems with it, you get a double advantage. One, you can go to the vendors and say, look at all the work we're helping you do, cut us a break on the price, and they will. Uh, and two, the vendors then have better software for the other people out in the world. Let's see. Oh, take the blinders off and listen to all sides, white hats, gray hats, and black hats. Uh, Loft likes to put itself right in the middle of its gray hats. I've seen a lot of people um, in the white hat community that 
absolutely turn a blind eye to um, the quote unquote bad guys, the black hats, and they won't look at what they're doing and they won't, you know, and they ignore it. This is the equivalent of, you know, the FBI looking into a carjacking ring or a car theft thing and refusing to talk to people who actually steal cars to figure out how it's done, maybe how they operate once they get the car, what do they do with it after that fact. Uh, the same thing I've seen a lot of black hats who are just like, oh, you know, I'm not going to talk to you, you work for the other side. No, no, you can't do that. Take the blinders off, get the information that you need. Now my, my favorite part is that everybody has to ask themselves these questions and I prof proffer that most of the people in the organizations out here can't answer these. Um, you have to ask yourself why you need to be secure in the first place. If you can't quantify and qualify what the risk is and how much it's going to cost and how much the uh, security stuff is going to impact it, you don't know what you're doing and you're just throwing, you know, you're throwing money away. Then you need to, along with that, balance the security versus the actual business strategy. If you say, we're not going to let the organization over there do business, and if, if we do that, that costs us $200 million, you know, maybe $200 million is within their risk budget. And finally, do you know where your crown jewels are? Not many people know. If you don't know what you're protecting, how can you protect it? If you can't answer those questions, don't go forward. And if you can't answer those questions, try and follow some of the things in the other slides on, uh, on some corporate paradigms that we've seen that do work and some other ways of, uh, of thinking about things. And I think the, hopefully the industry and whatnot will start moving in the right direction. Thank you very much for your time.